Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Sunday evening Bible study here at the Washington Avenue Church of Christ. Uh, tonight we'll be continuing uh, a series of lessons that David Rogers has begun called Asking for a Friend. Uh, before we begin, though, I do have a number of individuals I would like to uh, make mention of in relation to our prayer list. Some of these were updates from this morning, but I also have some new individuals that uh, would like to add to our prayer list since this morning. Uh, first of all, I want to make note that uh, Blossom Weddle is now at home. Uh, she's no longer at St. Vincent Hospital and is uh, receiving outpatient treatment. Uh, also, Lanny Hill, uh, who uh, we was in our prayer request, uh, who had been suffering from COVID, uh, has now also been diagnosed with diabetes. So we want to include Lanny or continue to keep Lanny in our prayers. Also, uh, as was mentioned this morning, we want to be mindful of Eric Gershbacher, uh, who is recovering from surgery. And Eric has asked for our prayers as he's been uh, dealing with some difficulties in that recovery. Um, also uh, mentioned this morning, uh, we want to be with uh, the family of Carol Bortelire. Uh, that is Valerie Cox's sister-in-law who passed away early this morning. So we want to keep that family in our prayers. Also, uh, Lisa Marquardt, who is a relative of uh, Cindy Holland, uh, who is uh, also uh, in need of our prayers as well. Uh, we mentioned this morning, so we want to continue to keep her as well in our prayers. I do have some additional uh, prayer requests uh, uh, were given to me uh, this morning and this evening. First of all, we want to keep uh, Joyce Edwards, who is Andrea Wunderlich's aunt, in our prayers. She has recently experienced a series of strokes uh, which have now uh, removed her sight. She, she can't see right now, and they are certainly obviously concerned about that, not only in terms of her health, but also uh, what to do next, because obviously uh, that will require uh, a great deal more care. So we want to continue to uh, be uh, keep uh, Joyce Edwards in our prayers. We also want to add to our prayer list uh, Farrah Paul. That is a three-year-old relative of Pearl Cummings and Margie Reisinger who is now uh, going through chemo for cancer. So uh, obviously we want to keep her in our prayer, or that family in our prayers. And also I uh, found out tonight, uh, we got a, a request from uh, Robert Hoag's. Robert Hoag's sister, Nelda Johnson, is an ICU down in Vanderbilt. And she is an ICU because she was mauled by a couple of dogs and received some serious injuries as a result of that. So obviously, that's someone we want to uh, keep in our prayers and add to our prayer list as well. And I believe that is all the updates to the list that I would like to, to make at this particular time. Uh, so for this evening, uh, in just a moment, uh, Danny Weddle will be leading us in prayer. Jerome Stewart will be reading the scripture. We'll have our lesson from David Rogers, and then we will be closed with a word of prayer from Alan Bush. So this time, I'm asking Danny to come forward, and he will lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you tonight, Father, just thankful for the blessings that we have. First of all, Father, we're so thankful that you gave your son to die on the cross for us. Father, we're thankful for your family. Father, we're thankful for your word and we pray as we listen to that word tonight that it will fill our hearts with your knowledge. We're thankful, Father, that we can approach you. We're thankful that we can serve you with all of our being. And Father, so many families are hurting because of illness and sickness and COVID because They've lost loved ones because they've had injuries, because they are suffering in so many ways. And we pray for them. And we pray, Father, that we will be patient in our service, that we will be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. We pray, Father, that we will use the right thinking as we interact in this world we live in, <clears throat> that this terrible disease will be conquered. But Father, we pray that we will always be reaching out to others, 
that we know, Father, the only solution is for men to have Christ and for Christ to be the guide and object of their life. Father, we're thankful for our leaders here, for our congregation, for our deacons who serve in so many ways, and for our preachers, and for the blessings that we enjoy as your people. Father, loneliness is a terrible thing, but if we'll fill our hearts with you and trust in you with all of our heart, we know that the days will be brighter in the future, and in the end, Father, you have a home prepared for us that's going to be wonderful. Thank you, Father, for giving us life and give us, Father, and have us to have more courage to reach out. We're so thankful, Father, for the opportunities that we have for the means to reach out, even electronically, in ways that could not even be imagined a few years ago that despite disease, despite challenges, people can be reached. Father, bless us and continue to bless us. Help us, Father, to continue simply to be your servants. And in the end, may you be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant enter in to paradise. Now, Father, forgive us of our sins. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, Acts chapter 8, verses 29 through 39. Acts chapter 8. Verses 29 through 39. And the Bible says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who would declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone or some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded to Cherry to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And good evening, church family. Good evening, friends and neighbors, uh, physical family who's back in Kentucky. So glad all of you all could uh, tune in tonight uh, to the live stream and open your Bibles as we go through God's Word, answering some questions. We've been in a Bible series where we're talking about asking for a friend. It's a series of questions that have come from people uh, that have concerns about how they are in their relationship with God making sure their faith is growing and strong and that they can be the Christians that God created them to be. So what we endeavor to do is to look at biblical questions and give biblical answers for them. Uh, this is uh, lesson number eight out of the series, and it has to do with the topic of baptism. You knew probably at some point baptism was going to come up in a question. And I love this question because of what's implied within it. Tonight's question we are dealing with says, how do I know 
if my baptism is all right, meaning all right with God. Now, what I love about the question is there's an implication from the person who would ask it, that there is a deep concern with being in a right relationship with God. There's a deep concern from understanding and appreciating the viewpoint of God as taking a priority over how I feel about a topic or what I want in the world. God's view has got to come first, and what uh, God wants has got to be how I direct my life. So how do I know if my baptism is all right? It's a great question. Mostly because we live in a world in which there are a variety of meanings and demonstrations of baptism. Do you think back right now to what your baptism was? Maybe it was something that took place in a river or a lake or an ocean. Maybe it was something that took place with friends and family surrounding you and out in the water with you. Maybe it took place in a baptistry. Maybe it took place at a baptismal font. Maybe it took place through a sprinkling or a pouring and any variation of things that the world uh, in today's use might refer to as a baptism. And the thing that we have to appreciate about so many of these things, sometimes we do have memories of them. And sometimes they took place at a point where we would not have a memory of the situation. But we know it was done because there's documentation and, and people tell us of the account and, and people made that decision for us. And we have to understand that when people made those decisions, it was a loving act that they did and what they thought was best for us. But when we talk about baptism tonight, and when we're going to talk about baptism from a biblical standpoint, what I want us to focus on is baptism that occurs when it matches up with what the Scripture requires, what God communicates, and what we choose to do. When we make a choice based on our understanding and teaching of the Scriptures that God has presented, and we make a decision to commit to Him, this is the baptism that we are interested in for tonight because we want to do what's right with God. And we see that God made choices. We appreciate the love and attention people uh, had given to us in our past. Uh, and now we want to honor that by doing what is right and taking responsibility for our salvation. In the context of this, this is, of course, directed towards people who probably already have some uh, determination to obey God to please Him and be dedicated to Him. Uh, many of you would be Christians, and many of you are saying, I think I'm a Christian. And some out there may be saying, well, you know what? I'd like to be a Christian. What does it mean? So as we go through this uh, topic tonight, I'd like for you to think of it in the context, okay, why does baptism matter? Is it just a ritual? Is it just a ceremony? Or is there something more that God expects from it, a greater purpose? Is there a right baptism? Is there a right way to do it? How do we figure out what that looks like? And number four, should I reconsider my baptism? Maybe, and maybe not. Let's go to the scriptures and kind of trace back a history of the baptisms that we see in the New Testament and see them unfold and how that came to be practiced by Jesus and his disciples and what that looked like for people that were becoming Christians and seeking the same thing we're asking in this question, which is, how do I know if my baptism is right with God? How do I know if I'm right with God? So if you got your Bibles, open them up and let's go back to consider John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. Now, if you remember in Matthew chapter 1, Jesus was born and came into uh, the incarnation. He was a little baby. And the angel Gabriel came and told Mary that he would be called Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. And he would also be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus was unlike any other that had ever been born on the earth. And he had a different purpose and a goal. And it was God who had come down to save mankind critical. But if we look over in the other Gospels, we can see that Mary had a cousin by the name of Elizabeth, and she was with child, and he would be about six months older than Jesus, and this would be John. And John would come with great purpose as well in order to prepare the way for Jesus. And so he would go out in the wilderness, and he would be uh, decked out in his finest camel hair and his leather belt, and he would eat the locusts and honeys, but he would fulfill that primary purpose he had, which was to proclaim, to proclaim the way for Jesus. Well, here's what that looked like. 
In Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, we said, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And here's what he said, Repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this would have been uh, incredibly important news, good news for any of the people that had come up under the old covenant, under the law of Moses, because there was an excitement and an anticipation for the Messiah, the Savior to come. And here John is proclaiming the news. Repent. We would use this in a church way today. Which we would think turn away from your sins, which is correct. It could also mean to change your mind. And he was challenging them. Any, any ways that are opposed to God, repent. Turn away from that. Any philosophies you follow that are opposed to God, turn away from that. Any traditions that you follow that are opposed to God and in um, conflict with him, turn away from that. Any lifestyle practices that you have, turn away from that and turn to God because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he would go on and the Bible would say, for this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. When he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Of course, this is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Some 700 years before this was to take place, God had a plan, and it was now coming into fruition. These are very deliberate things that God has put into motion for the benefit and salvation of mankind. So, of course, there was great excitement and thrills when John went about preaching in the wilderness, and crowds would gather and the things that he were, was doing was amazing. It was talked about by kings and by commoners, by scribes and Pharisees. And what he was doing uh, was really, really gathering people's attentions because Mark 1 verse 4 says that he was proclaiming a baptism, an immersion of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John was challenging people in a multitude of ways. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Christ is here. I'm preparing the way for Jesus. And you remember those great moments he had when Jesus would show up and he would say, Behold, behold the Lamb of God. He would make those statements that he was not even worthy to loosen the sandals on Jesus' feet. He would give these incredible teachings and really challenge people to listen to Jesus. We'll get to a couple here in just a second. But what he was doing in the midst of this that really might have grabbed their attention was the fact that he was baptizing in the River Jordan, where he baptized Jesus and other uh, places in the area, which meant he was taking the people and he was immersing them under the water and bringing them out for the forgiveness of sins, for repentance. Now, as he was doing that, he would go to places, and it tells us in John chapter 3, verse 23, that he went to this area called Anon because there was much water there. So we know it had to be a place that was uh, deep enough for the people to go under, and that was an objective that he had. The other thing that's interesting about John chapter 3, verse 23, isn't just the point of much water, but the previous verse, John 3, 22. Because in John 3, 22, it tells us that Jesus and his disciples came up to Judea, and they were also involved in baptizing. Now, as you get further down in John chapter 3, you can see that John's disciples were asking questions about these people that were out baptizing as well. And then John's using that as an opportunity to further teach about Jesus. And he says to them that, that he points to the fact that Jesus is from above and he carries a message from God. And he gives this great line in John chapter 3 and verse 30 that says, He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. He's trying to get people to see that Jesus is just not some man. He is the Son of God. And Jesus comes with an eternal purpose. Jesus is coming for the salvation of mankind. Jesus is coming to cleanse us from our sins. He's preparing the way and preparing the people for this. In fact, at the end of this chapter, if you go down to verse 36, uh, he says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides in him. In the very next chapter, we see more baptism taking place. And the scribes and Pharisees, they had heard that Jesus had baptized more disciples than John. 
Though verse 2 says Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples. Which shows that Jesus and his disciples were participating in this uh, baptism in the early stages as well. It's an interesting time period because we're in a transitional phase. When you think about the large scope of the Bible, we understand that uh, under the old law, the old covenant, this would be the law of Moses, they had practices and, and things that they did to deal with sin. Like, for example, the Day of Atonement would be uh, one of the most important days for the Jews um, to honor God and to reflect on their sins, but also to offer atonement for their sins. But it wouldn't completely take it away. It would simply cover it up uh, for a year, and then they would come back to the Day of Atonement again. God had told them that a better way is coming. In Jeremiah chapter 31, the prophet Jeremiah tells them of a new covenant is coming to take place. And it would be superior to the previous one. And it would be one in which their sins would be gone, utterly gone. A kind of freedom they had not known, the, the repetition of the sacrifices or something that they were bound to. But this was a separation from this. Uh, this was a practice that they could see utter freedom from sin and the burden and the consequence of it. And Jesus had come to make that reality. So in this time period in which John comes proclaiming the kingdom of heaven, we're in a transition period. And Jesus has gathered his disciples, and he's now participating in this because he is training them, he is teaching them, he is getting them ready for a time period in the future for where his kingdom is established and people will be added to it by their own choice. And so we see them baptizing at this moment. He would go through this for about three years. According to the Gospel of John, there would be several Passovers, and we figure it's probably about three years. This time period with John the Baptizer is very early in uh, the history of Jesus on earth and his ministry. We're going to skip ahead a little bit to when Jesus would uh, be closer to fulfilling what he came to do. He wasn't coming to destroy the law, as he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, but to fulfill it. And in fulfilling it, he would be ushering in the time for the new covenant. And this is what he had prepared his disciples for doing. So when we move to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus is now at a point where he's died, he's been buried, he's resurrected, and he's given them this purpose. And he says to him in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, that all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Do you see the scope of that? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth earth. And then he tells them to go to all nations. And in going to all nations, he's wanting them to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's to make them disciples. And in going to all nations, he would then tell them to teach whatsoever things that he had commanded them. And he would say, lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. And so in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we see that now we've gone from just this regional area uh, in which the commission had been to teach them to practice baptism and teach repentance, but to broaden the scope because of a divine authority to all nations. He's training them, preparing them, think bigger than just the local area. Of course, they were in the Jordan River, and this is an image of the Jordan River, and that's where they would begin their teaching and their training. But Jesus is now taking them to a bigger, worldly, global, everybody kind of picture. Here's a picture of the Caribbean. I've seen some amazing baptisms in the, the Caribbean and great joy because of it. He would tell them to go to far off places, desert regions, that they may have never even conceived of going uh, before. And over time, they would go to far, far places, off to the east, like the Japan or China uh, and the farthest reaches around the uh, earth. Eventually, the gospel would come to such fine, fine places of Appalachia in America, and it would even go to the far, far reaches of Canada in the north. Challenging places, but the gospel was intended for all. And so over time, there had to be a global mindset that this would be taken to all people. And that's a command that was given to baptize and to teach to make disciples. Baptize and teach to make disciples. And in the baptism, there would be the immersion. 
And that's why when we mentioned earlier that John was uh, baptizing at Anon uh, near Salem because water was plentiful there. And that's why, if you noticed in all of the pictures we gave of uh, throughout the world, did you notice there's water in every single one? Humans must exist somewhere near water. We need it to survive, absolutely need it to survive. And so God was giving a command, something for us to do that was so reasonable and in his wisdom, accessible, easy to make possible in obedience to him. We have a divine command and expectation that baptism would take place anywhere in the world for all people who were taught. This was amazing. The old covenant was a thing that was primarily uh, exclusively for the, the Hebrew people. And now we're transitioning into a new covenant that would access for all people. Absolutely have access for all people and freedom from sin. And baptism would certainly be a part of this. Now, this would come by divine authority and command. Important for us to remember so after this command, we've come to the realization that Jesus has uh, already gone through his death, as he knew and he would predict and tell people uh, was going to happen, his burial and his resurrection, absolutely critical moments of Christianity. In fact, the Old Testament would be fulfilled because of these actions, and it would be world-changing what would take place, absolutely world-changing. In Ephesians chapter 2, 15 and 16, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, uh, Paul would write and would be telling the people in Ephesus and in uh, Colossae about how there was a time in which they were under, uh, the Jewish people were under the old law, but that Jesus had brought an end to that in the fulfillment. In Ephesians chapter 2, starting in 14, he says, For he himself is our peace who has made both one, referring to the Jews and the Gentiles, he's brought them together. And he broken down the middle wall of separation, the old covenant and its expectation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 talks about the fact that he's wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When Jesus died on the cross and he was fulfilling the expectations uh, and the prophecies of the Old Testament, it had come to a close. And that which he had prepared his disciples for was now going to be in full effect. A transition period was over and now we move into the new covenant. Paul talks about it in greater length using these great illustrations. I love the book of Romans tremendously and the book of Hebrews tremendously. Probably my two favorite books uh, in the New Testament just to sit down and read because they are so rich uh, with uh, their teachings of Christ and the practice of Christianity. Romans 7 in particular, he starts talking about uh, how marriage is a good way to illustrate uh, the requirements uh, with the law and the expectations of God. If someone is married, well, that's a marriage for life and a covenant and something to keep for life. And if you were to leave the one you're married and go to another, you'd be called an adulteress and it would be sinful and absolutely wrong. But if the one you were married to dies, you are free to be with another. And as he was using this illustration to get to a bigger picture, that those people that thought they were still committed to the old law needed to realize that they were free. And they were now joined to Christ in the new law. Hebrews chapter 9, verses uh, 14 through 17, actually there's a whole chapter there. The writer of the book of Hebrews, he's using an example of a testament and a testator. And uh, you can think of it kind of like a will, that someone would be, uh, if they had a will, it comes into effect when that person dies, when they passes. And he's saying this is exactly what's happened when Jesus died and he was buried and he was resurrected and his blood was shed, this means we've come into the new covenant, a transition. So expectations by God should be followed under that covenant. And this is the state we move into in Acts chapter 1. Jesus had died, he's buried, resurrected. He's fulfilled the law. He has prepared his disciples. He's trained them for the plan that God has had since the beginning of time uh, that the fulfillment should be that mankind should be saved by those who would be in Christ. And now his disciples 
who are going to take action to draw others into Christ. The kingdom is here. So Jesus ascends in Acts chapter 1. The disciples have been trained, and they're going to make this happen in Jerusalem. Holy Spirit comes on them in Acts chapter 2, and it's world-changing absolutely world-changing. Even to this day, the ripples from that moment, that day, the teachings that would take place have transformed their world all the way up to ours now, and they will until Jesus comes again. Peter got up to preach. The people would come for the festival, the harvest. The day of Pentecost was there. Thousands of people would have been in Jerusalem to hear this message. And Peter starts doing exactly what Jesus gave him the command to do. Make disciples. There's going to be teaching taking place. All the things that Jesus had commanded. And the Holy Spirit had come to give them the remembrance of the things that Jesus had said. Had gave them the understanding to be able to proclaim this gospel truth in a way that would translate and be understood by the people from all the different nations. And so Peter gets up and boldly begins preaching to people the good news of Jesus because the kingdom of heaven is here. And when he gets up and he teaches them, he starts pointing back to the prophecies in the Old Testament, the ones that they should have uh, used to build their anticipation and expectation for the Messiah. And he quotes from Joel chapter 2, and this is the moment that Joel was talking about. And he points out that Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, he is of the lineage of David, and he's fulfilled that prophecy as well. And he points out and convicts them of what they had done that was so horrible and terrible that it was that Jesus they had called for his death. He's not shying away from the sinfulness of what's taken place, but he's allowing them to come and reflect their relationship with God because of that. And he says, this Jesus, the one that they turned on, the one that they called for his death, the one that they rejected, God had recognized him as Lord and Christ. And then they come to this realization. You know they come to it. The guilt hits them. The realization of where they actually are in their relationship with God strikes them. And they ask that question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Can you imagine the hopelessness they might have felt at that moment? Not just that they had sinned, and not just that in some theological way, in some theoretical way, they understood that sin separates them from God and acknowledged that in an intellectual way, but they were struck with the realization that they had not only rebelled, but called for the death of the Christ, that they had utterly turned on Him and God's plans. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter could have condemned and walked away and said, you get what you deserve. But Peter gives them this gospel message. He said, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Repent, that's that turn away thing that was being taught all the way back with John. Be baptized, that's that thing that we saw them trained to do all the way back to John in those years leading up to this moment be immersed. Why? It's the authority of Jesus. It's the authority that the Great Commission was given on, the expectation for them to do this. Be immersed. What's that going to do? It's going to be for the remission of sins. Your sins will be utterly forgiven. It had to draw up Jeremiah 31, that expectation for this new covenant that they're now under, and what excitement must must, must they have been under. They weren't hopeless. There's hope in Jesus if they follow and obey what's necessary, if they do it with the purpose and expectation that God had given, then they would know that they were doing it in a way that was all right, all right with God because it's the way that he had designed it. So we get down to Acts 2 verse 41 and we get this passage. So those who received the word were baptized and and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. It's those who received his word. They acted out of conviction of their sin, out of knowledge of what God had uh, set in order and where they were in their relationship. They received the word and they responded in obedience with baptism, immersed in water. 3,000 of them that day. Man, can you imagine the amount of joy on that particular day? And it would continue throughout the book of Acts. In overwhelming numbers, 
and amazing stories and situations that would unfold. We don't have time to go through all of them, so I've made this so you can jot down some of the principal ones. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, what we just read in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were added to the church. Acts chapter 8, we skip up to there. Philip goes into Samaria, and he's preaching to the Samaritans, and they are listening and they are responding. In verse 12, the Samaritans are becoming Christians, and it says they are baptized. In verse 13 of Acts chapter 8, Simon, who was a sorcerer, uh, practicing dark arts for financial gain, he's listening and he repents and turns and he's baptized, becoming a Christian. If you skip on down in Acts chapter 8, you get to verse 38. And this is from the passage Jerome read in which the Ethiopian eunuch had been taught, had been studying. And Philip says, "Um, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone teaches me? And so then he received instruction from Philip. And in the midst of being taught about Jesus, he says, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Which allows us the implication that baptism was taught in the teaching of Jesus. That makes sense. And when he was baptized, they went down into the water so that he could be immersed, and they came up out of the water, so he went on his way rejoicing. Acts chapter 10, 47 and 48, the baptism of Cornelius, the first Gentile to become a Christian. Acts 16, verse 33, the Philippian jailer is baptized. Acts 18, verse 8, uh, there were several people that were baptized in Corinth, and one of them was a Jewish leader uh, named Crispus at that time. And in Acts 19, verse 5, Paul had baptized several men who did not have complete understanding of God's expectations uh, in the city of Ephesus. But they wanted to, and so they were baptized by Paul in the name of Jesus, for the correct reason. That is how that continued. And throughout history, from the first century until the 21st century, baptisms have been taking place in obedience to God in the way that He gave us uh, instruction to do so in Scripture to please Him. Which brings us to our question. I gave all that context for a reason. Most of the questions we have about the idea is, how do I know if my baptism is all right? can probably be answered by what we've just covered from a biblical standpoint. But we may need to fine-tune that just a little bit. And I wanted to give that just a little bit of time if you'll stay with us. Here are some specific questions. Did my baptism match the biblical command and example? When you think back to your baptism, did it match what we just covered in the biblical example of baptism. Meaning, was it preceded by teaching and understanding? Was was I taught and brought to understanding prior to my baptism? Because in every example we look at in scriptures, and even when we hear the commandments of Jesus, there needed to be teaching and understanding so that a person could take ownership of their choice realize what God wanted, and then decide to obey out of faith. That had to precede the baptism. If that did, okay, that's, that's matching up. That's great. And, and when you come through that moment of the teaching and the understanding, did you come to a realization that you had a need for a Savior? Were you convicted of your sins? Did you realize that you were not in uh, Jesus, that you were separate from God because of your sins, and you had to take action? You had to respond to the gospel. Did that take place? And if you realize you're in your sin, maybe your lifestyle is not one that's pleasing to God. Maybe you have habits that would separate you from God. God provided all the information we need to know what that means whether it's uh, sexual immorality or drunkenness or hatred or gossiping or any of the other things that you can find in the Scriptures, did you turn away from that? Did you turn away from it? Maybe you follow after some worldly uh, philosophy or ideology. Uh, Maybe you follow after man-made traditions. Did you repent from that and turn away and turn to God as best you can? Did you confess and commit to Jesus as the Lord? Did you commit to him as the Son of God, as the Christ? Did you commit to him as your Lord, the authority over your life? That's necessary. We've seen this in all the examples. If so, then of course proceeding to baptism 
would make sense. It would absolutely make sense. But if we stop and we're honest and we say, no, oh, you know what? I was so young, I don't, I don't know what teaching took place. If I was a baby, I don't know if I could understand that situation. That's a fair thing to reflect on. I'm not saying that out of judgment or criticism or to put anyone down, but the question has to do with, am I doing it in a way that's all right with God? Did I do it the way God wanted it to be done? I got to be able to honestly do that. And in loving God, let me pursue that in a way that is most pleasing to him. I need to give it that consideration. So did I follow it the biblical command and example? It means I have to ask all the details about it as well. In the world, there's, there's many ways that people have done acts, ritual acts tied to religious practices that is called baptism, but doesn't match the baptism in the Bible. Was I sprinkled? And that called baptism? Because that's not what took place in the Bible. Was I poured on? And that's called baptism? Well, that's not what we see in the Bible as well. And again, that's not to be disrespectful or insulting, but let's do what God expects. The word literally means immerse, we've said numerous times. If Jesus had meant pouring or sprinkling, there's words that he would have used for that. There's absolutely plenty of words that they would have used in the Greek or in the Aramaic or in the Hebrew to represent that idea. But time and time again, they use the word uh, baptizo, or some form of it, which literally means to immerse under. Let's do that as clearly and as best we can with what God expects. Let's do that. Then we can know, all right, I'm all right. I was taught, I understood, okay. I come to realization of where I am uh, without Jesus in my life and because of sin and I and I've, can turn towards him and repent of that. I can confess that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God and commit my life to him. Then I can be immersed. Then I can be baptized. Romans chapter six, three and four tells us that the act itself is so deeply tied to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. When we read those scriptures, we see that we become dead to sins, uh, that we are buried with him in baptism as we go under. And when we come up, we rise in newness in life, like the resurrection of Jesus. But it's not symbolic alone. There's actual things that are taking place in that moment. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, it says, when we are baptized, we're baptized into Christ. Those of us who were baptized were baptized into Christ. And when we read through the other scriptures, like Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, all spiritual blessings are found in Christ. And we know that those in Christ, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you read from verses 17 down, you'll find that those are the people that have been reconciled, brought back together with God and are new creatures. Why? Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 reminds us that we have been washed washed in the blood of Jesus. We're clean. We're free. Our sins are remitted, forgiven, like they said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Out of faith, we've obeyed, and we are now one with Jesus. We are in Christ. That's a powerful thing that's taking place. It's not just some ritual. That's a powerful thing to realize. One of the great questions as we move along here that comes uh, with, am I, am I right with God? Is my baptism all right with God? I get this one a lot. Did I understand enough before I was baptized? Did I understand enough? It's a good question. It's a really good question. Uh, sometimes we wonder how much you have to know before you are baptized. And I'm going to give you an example here pretty quick. And I'm going to go to math. You know that subject that so many people say, will I ever use these formulas in my life anywhere? All right, we're going to use one tonight in talking about the Bible. Do you remember the Pythagorean theorem? You probably picked it up somewhere around middle school. You might have heard about it in late elementary school. And right now you might be able to recite it. If I get it started, I bet it's going to click for you. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's one of the most basic formulas that we learn. And it's one of the first ones where we hear ourselves complain, I will never use this in my life. But then over time, you might find you do. Let me give you an example. Farmer buys a plot of land and he buys a goat. He decides that he's going to pin the goat in one corner of the plot of the land so that the goat can eat the field, a rectangular field. 
and he needs to figure out what length of rope he needs to buy. Now, if he paid attention to his math teacher, he would think, oh yeah, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That applies to any right triangle. Sure, if I split down the length of the field right from one corner to the other, that's the same thing we talked about in math class, the hypotenuse. That's exactly how much rope I need to buy. I'll just put that into practice. Now, what he did was use his understanding in a way that affected his life. If we back up here a little bit, you can teach any six-year-old to say A squared plus B squared equals C squared. They're speaking truth. But do they understand it? Could they actually work and use that? If you threw down a right triangle and gave them one that had a leg of uh, three feet and another leg of four feet, would they be able to work the formula and tell you that the hypotenuse is five feet? Probably not. There's some gifted kids, that's for sure, and some could. And over time, would they be able to take that and be able to recite it back in truth? Would they be able to understand the mechanics of it? And then would they be able to live out the reality of that formula in a very practical sense, like a farmer figuring out how long rope should be for his goat to cover a whole field? It works the same way with scriptures. When we ask the question, do I know enough, do I know enough, here's the thing I would ask you. Can you recite truth? That's a good place to start. And any people that can do that, no matter your age, I commend you. The more that you memorize scripture, the richer your life's going to be. But you can't stop there. It's not just about reciting things back. You got to develop that understanding. Can you put it together in the way that the mechanics of the scriptures work? And you understand what it means for Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God. Do you understand who God the Father is? Do you understand the Holy Spirit and, and His actions in inspiring people to uh, record the Scriptures so that we could understand the will of God? Do you use that and understand what the mechanics are of sin is and how from Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2, sin separates us from God and creates an incredible problem for our world, a darkness that puts us in a lost state? There's an intellectual understanding of that that comes, and maybe you can take those verses and put them together. That's building on it and understanding sort of the mechanics of the Scriptures. But here's the critical part. Do I understand enough? Do you see where that puts you in your relationship with God? Do you see how that affects you, and you're able to take that knowledge of truth that you can recite and speak, and you understand the mechanics, and, and how that's all interconnected from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the knowledge of God and who He is and, and what He gave in His will and how bad He wants us to be in heaven and how He's prepared that way and even what that means and how baptism's a part of that. But do you understand what that means for the way that you live your life? That in being cleansed of sin draws you closer. Do you understand what it means for Jesus to die and pay for your sins and how that you will respond in faith to that? It's the real application of it, the effect on your life. That's what you need to understand. Now let me be honest. That Pythagorean theorem, that A squared plus B squared plus C equals C squared, man, it gets way more complicated. If you spend time doing all that math stuff and enjoy yourself if you do, uh, I do love it, you will find it gets incredibly complicated. And as you use it more in life, you'll build on that knowledge and you'll look back and go like, man, I didn't know a whole lot in seventh grade. This got far more complicated. But it doesn't discredit what you knew at that age. To be sure, in the scriptures, it's the same thing. As you get older, you're going to understand things in a much more complex way and uh, experiential way because you're going to go through things in life. That doesn't discredit what you knew and you understood and you could apply at a younger age. So did you understand enough? Well, that's a question you have to answer. And I would ask you to use that to sort of think on it a little bit. If you're 27, I hope you know more than you knew at 12. And if you're 47, I hope you knew more than you did at 27. And if you're 87, please come teach us. We would so benefit from your wisdom and experience in the scriptures. It's a growing process, but it doesn't discredit what you knew from before. You got to build on it. 
and put that into practice. Which brings us to the last point. Was I baptized for the purpose God intended? Was I baptized from the purpose God intended? It's a good question. Sometimes we're baptized because our parents want us to be. Our family puts pressure on us to do it. And that's not us making the choice. We need to reconsider. Sometimes we're baptized because we go through ritual just for the sake of ritual. That's not what God intended. If we were baptized because we knew we were guilty of sin and we knew freedom was to come from Jesus and we knew the truth of what the Scripture uh, gave us about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit and the plan of salvation and the meaningness, meaningfulness of the church and what it meant to commit to that, and we were baptized because we wanted to be in Christ and receive the fullness of blessings that come from that and live and serve and be a light for Him, okay, wow, you are on point. That's the purpose. That's the purpose. we got to do it for the reason that God gave, and then we can have eternal life and be with Him in heaven. So were you baptized for the right reason? That's for you to answer. I hope so. I think so. But if you think there's a possibility not, you need to honestly consider the Scriptures and ask the questions. Go through that. Be genuine. Be honest. If you have more questions and would like to talk with someone, feel free to do so. Reach out. God loves you. This church loves you so much. And if you are faithful and true and you are deeply in Jesus according to the Scriptures, I challenge you to reach out and you share that gospel. You teach as best you can and you do whatever uh, you can to share and let people know about Jesus. I'm very proud of uh, people that are finding ways to do that above and beyond uh, COVID-19. Uh, I have a family member, niece. she's in three Bible studies right now online. Does she know the people? Nope. She's getting to know them and she's teaching them about Jesus. I'm very proud of her for that. And I know there's many that are doing the same thing. Let's keep pressing on as the church. Let's keep making sure that we, we are doing our best to be all right with God. Thank you so much. Let us close out our service tonight with a word of prayer. Blessed Father, we come to your throne of glory, and Father, we are so thankful for your word. And Father, it is our prayer that you help each and every one of us to get into your message. Father, there are so many questions we might have in this life, and we know you have the answers for them. Father, help us to truly study your word, to get into your message and live by it. Father, the message tonight that David brought means so much because it's your message, Father. We pray, Father, if there's any among us that are struggling with our baptisms, that we again do as David suggested, get into your word, study your word, and make sure our baptisms line up with your word. Father, again, it means so much because it means we're honoring you. And help us all, Father, to have the attitude that we truly want to honor you each and every day of our lives. Father, we love you. We thank you for your message. We thank you, Father, for the daily blessings you give to us. And Father, we thank you for sending your Son so that we can have salvation from our sins. Bless us this week, Father. Help us to have a good week and help us, Father, to again in every aspect of our lives honor you. And we offer this prayer in your son's blessed name. Amen.